Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff, and in this video, we're going to be doing something a little bit different, something a little more on the fun side. We're going to be looking at a case study, specifically of something that happened to me uh, a little over a year ago. And long story short, it ended up being a really bad case of Oz trigonum syndrome, also called posterior impingement syndrome. And I talk about this, the theory of it, that is, in another video in more detail. So go check that out if you are interested. So let's start with the history of the condition. So this started all the way back in around Christmas time of December 2021. So we were visiting my parents uh, for Christmas and during that time we were going to the gym around where they lived. And so we go to the gym just like normal, but what I started to notice afterward, after we left at some point, is that I have pain in my ankle. Not pain specifically in the ankle joint, but in the tendons surrounding the ankle. It felt like tendinopathies, which I've had off and on in the past, but nothing too terrible. They just go away within about a day or so. Um, but it seemed to be, affect all the tendons, all the main ones, Achilles tendinopathy, posterior tib, the fibularis muscles. And what was interesting is that it could be any of them at any given time, depending on the day or the time of day and it could be more than one of them, and it seemed to switch throughout the day. But by the end of the day, I'd go to bed, wake up the next morning, and generally I was fine, which doesn't really fit the pattern of a tendinopathy. Usually they're pretty bad in the morning. Once you get moving, it gets a little bit better, and then it gets worse throughout the day. But that's what it felt like. It felt like multiple tendinopathies. Well, Christmas passed, and we ended up driving home, and this is, I believe, on December 29th. Um, I noticed that my foot started to swell, started to swell pretty bad. Um, it was a slow process and it kind of progressed linearly over the course of that day. Um, and then we drove to Boulder, Colorado and we got there on, I believe, December 30th. And it was on that day that I said, you know what, I got to go to urgent care. Um, the swelling was just really, really bad, really painful. I'll get into that a little bit more later in the video. But we went to urgent care on December 30th, 2021. So this right here, this is what the urgent care doctors would have seen in Boulder, Colorado on December 30th. This picture was not taken then, it was taken at a later time during a separate flare up as I came to call it, but it's the same thing. Uh, the foot is horrendously swollen everywhere, forefoot and toes, midfoot. The rear foot you can't really see here, but it was just as swollen. The entire foot was purple, um, and when you poked on it, it was boggy. There was so much swelling in there. It felt disgusting. It was extremely painful, and you can kind of see it here in this picture. Uh, you can see that the big toe side is actually closer to the camera than the little toe side. And that's because what ended up happening is there was so much swelling around the ankle joint that the swelling got inside the ankle joint. And this is just a physics principle, okay? If you've got a, a space, let's say a joint, right? And joints all have their open packed, which is pretty close to their resting position, right? We know the resting position of the ankle is a little bit of plantar flexion, a little bit of inversion, right? Now, assuming there's not an excessive amount of fluid in there, the joint can move freely. But if you take that space and you flood it with fluid, so it's at 100 or beyond 100% capacity, the joint will move into its open packed position and it'll get stuck there and won't be able to move. So this ankle was pretty much locked in about 20 degrees of plantar flexion and about at 15 degrees of inversion and it would not move out of that. Um, I could try to move it actively or passively, but even moving it like two or three degrees was excruciating. It was really painful, it was stuck in that position. Um, and to be honest with you, they said it was gout. That was the first doctor's hypothesis that I ever got, that it was gout. Now, I was not a PT yet when this happened. Um, I had finished PT school, but I really didn't have any experience in the clinic and certainly not with anything like this. So I just took their word for it. But looking back, this is nothing what gout looks like. They did give me some prednisone and the prednisone, it was a taper over the course of like 10 days or something like that. And it did get rid of this. Um, it actually started to work pretty quickly, took a lot of the pain away, started to get the swelling out. And within a few days, it was the swelling was completely gone. Um, this was totally gone. Um, over the course of honestly about 10 months, I got all sorts of doctor's hypotheses of what this was because they couldn't figure it out. 
um, that it was just an extreme hallux valgus. It was an Achilles tendinopathy, tibialis posterior tendinopathy, fibularis longus or brevis tendinopathy, flexor hallucis longus tendinopathy. The, the reason for that is because my hallux MTP joint wouldn't move. Um, if I tried to flex the big toe, I would get an extreme amount of pain around my heel. If I tried to tilt it back into extension, same thing. And it really just was not moving. The big toe just wouldn't move. So they thought it might have been this. Another condition on the differential diagnosis list was compartment syndrome, but that was also ruled out. And by this point, I had started seeing some podiatrists and they also were confused. It was a, it was a, it was a head scratcher as they called it. So when doctors don't know what to do or don't know what's going on, a lot of times they go down the route of, well, maybe it's a chronic pain condition or an autoimmune condition. Um, which I don't blame them for. I mean, this was a head scratcher. So the next step was to refer me to a rheumatologist um, because there were certain things that were also in the differential, like psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, complex regional pain syndrome, those were ruled out. Um, earlier on, so not in this order of conditions, they'd ruled out blood clots, so DVTs. And one doctor even suggested the idea of post-COVID microclots. Apparently, if you get COVID, which I have had in the past, uh, you can develop microclots which are very, very small clots, not the, to the size of DVTs, nowhere near that size, but little baby clots that can occlude very small blood vessels and limit blood flow to certain tissues. So maybe causing something like this um, or other venous or lymphatic blockages. Another doctor even suggested I have a really bad gluten intolerance um, because nothing else seemed to make sense. Um, an intolerance that was bad, but not quite to the point of celiac disease. So causing some systemic low-grade inflammation leading to all this swelling. And then of course you've got other musculoskeletal conditions like ankle impingement, anterior or posterior, the latter of which is actually right on point. And then another thing was idiopathic spontaneous midfoot fusions. Um, on my x-ray, and it seems that it was just an artifact of the x-ray, but it looked like a few of the bones in the midfoot were starting to fuse. So maybe that could cause some of this. Um, but it turns out posterior ankle impingement was on point. So how do they try to figure out what's going on? They do imaging and lab studies. So one of the first things they did is an x-ray. And they noted hallux valgus, because I do have a bunion on the right side, and possible fusion of the navicular, the calcaneus, and the talus. But as I said on the previous slide, they did note that that could have been an artifact and actually not present. It was just something because of the imaging nature and the angle. So they weren't sure if this was actually the case at that point, but they did note an Oz trigona. Now this x-ray image, this is not my foot. This is just something I got off the internet. Um, however, it illustrates the point well enough. Here's the Oz trigona. It's a free floating bone. It sits posterior to the talus, superior to the calcaneus, and then anterior to the Achilles tendon, which would be right here. So that's your Oz trigona. Now this right here, this is my MRI. This is an MRI of my right ankle and foot. Now some things they did not find on this MRI, there was no inflammation noted at the hallux, despite the fact that I had limited hallux motion, inflection, and extension. So that right there mostly ruled out a flexor hallucis longus tendinopathy. And there was also no inflammation noted anterior to the talus, including near the navicular. So it doesn't really seem like there's any of that fusion that they were talking about, and really no anterior ankle impingement. But what they did find, they found fibularis brevis tenosynovitis, so significant inflammation around the base, the base of the fifth metatarsal. They found cystic changes at the posterior talus, which is right around where the os trigonum is. And there was inflammation surrounding the os trigonum, which is right here. Now it's not a super clear image, uh, and the os trigonum, generally speaking, is pretty small, but you can see that inflammation right there. And that's what led them to believe that that's approximately where the pain generator was and the cause of all these issues. But really the question is why would that, just that little bone, even if it was irritated, why is it causing the entire foot to swell up like that? So before I get into these lab values, let me give you a little more information here on how this presented. So I mentioned that first flare up in Boulder, Colorado. They gave me the prednisone and it helped. It got rid of the swelling, it got rid of the pain. 
But ever since then, there was always just a little bit of swelling in that right ankle. It was only swelling that you could feel by, by palpating that area. You would palpate the right ankle, palpate the left, and you say, yeah, the right side is a little bit swelling. But it would kind of remain that little bit of swelling. And over the course of the day, it would increase a little bit and then go back down. I'd go to bed, I'd wake up, it's down, come back up during the course of the day, and it would just follow this kind of sinusoidal pattern, right? But what would inevitably happen, for reasons unknown to me at the time, is at some point that swelling would hit a critical threshold where the swelling wasn't able to decrease, and then it would just be a positive feedback cycle, and you get more and more and more swelling leading to a flare-up. And what would end up happening is nothing helped. I would end up having to go to urgent care, or in one case it was actually the ER, and they would have to give me prednisone. A prednisone taper anywhere between a week and 14 days. And that was the only thing that ended up helping. So this picture that I showed you earlier on, this was a picture during one of those trips to the hospital. So these lab values right here, these were taken during an active flare-up and they were not done in urgent care. I actually went to the hospital for this one because this particular flare-up was really, really bad. And they took these lab values while I was there. Uh, white blood cells were high, specifically neutrophils. There's definitely some kind of inflammation going on. Um, for ions, sodium and chloride were low. It's probably because I was dehydrated. I was sitting in a waiting room for five hours with minimal water and certainly no added electrolytes. So I wasn't super concerned about those. Uh, my uric acid was high. Um, uric acid being high doesn't necessarily indicate a problem. Um, and it's not even definitive for gout. In fact, it has a very low specificity for gout. Um, if you eat a high protein diet, particularly if you're in the realm of fitness or bodybuilding, you're probably gonna have a higher uric acid level than most. Uh, but what's really concerning is the CRP, C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is a non-specific marker for inflammation. And you can see the normal values being less than 10 milligrams per liter. Mine was 91, so basically over nine times the maximum uh, level allowed for normal. That's pretty elevated and very concerning. Now, as you can see here by the headline, I obviously went on to have surgery, but as with any elective surgery, you'd usually try conservative therapy first. And there were some issues that I had. So hallux rigidus and associated gait abnormalities. The hallux was rigid not because of the joint itself, which is usually what the case is for hallux rigidus, but it's because the flexor hallucis longus tendon was so pissed off. It couldn't be moved. I couldn't activate the muscle to flex the toe. More importantly, I couldn't passively or actively extend those MTP joints, specifically the hallux MTP joint, which is a problem when you're walking because as you land and then you eventually go into pre-swing, those MTP joints have to be able to passively extend upwards of about 45 to 60 degrees of extension. It couldn't even extend five degrees, so that's a problem. So the way I got around that when I was walking is every time I stepped, here's heel strike, loading response, stance, and then I would have to externally rotate the foot before swinging it to avoid having to use that hallux MTP. And that repetitive external rotation or eversion right before every swing phase led to that fibularis brevis tenosynovitis that they saw on the MRI. Now, flare-up positioning of the ankle joint. We kind of already talked about this earlier on. You can see here, hopefully, that the ankle is locked in about 20 degrees of plantar flexion and maybe 10 to 15 degrees of inversion. If your ankle is stuck like that, and even trying to move it two or three degrees is excruciating, you're not gonna be able to stand on that foot. Try putting your foot in plantar flexion and inversion. You can't stand on it. So there were many days when I was working as a physical therapist, I'd be on crutches, and there was one time where the left side also flared up. That's right. This also happened on the left side. It was nowhere near the severity, but the left side also got locked in a position about 50% of what this is. So maybe 10 degrees of plantar flexion, maybe five to 10 degrees of inversion. And that put me in a wheelchair for about a week um, before I was able to get to uh, the urgent care or the ER, whatever it happened to be, and they gave me prednisone, which took that away. 
So definitely weight-bearing issues. And then during the remission periods between the flare-ups, there were all these insertional tendinopathies, Achilles, posterior tip, fibularis longus and brevis. To, to put it simply, this was not fun in this pre-surgical period. And conservative treatment unfortunately failed. I had tried over-the-counter pain medications, ibuprofen, naproxen, etc. We tried stretches, strengthening exercises, modalities, heat or ice with elevation, ultrasound, high voltage pulse current for edema, manual therapy as in edema or retrograde massage, other manual therapy techniques like traction, mobilizations, manipulation, A-STEM. Um, I tried resting it without using it. Dorsiflexion night splinting, ankle bracing, complete cessation from dietary gluten. Nothing worked. In fact, the only thing that worked was prednisone. Prednisone was the only thing that ever took the swelling out, which in turn took the pain away. And as you know, you cannot be on prednisone indefinitely. And you sh certainly should try to not be on it for repetitive tapers over the course of a year. So what did I do? Well, I ultimately had surgery, a surgical excision of the Os trigonum. So the diagnosis going into the surgery was right Os trigonum syndrome. Yes, they knew I had an Os trigonum because they saw it on the x-ray and they saw it along with swelling on the MRI. But they were not even sure this was the pain generator, really I should say the swelling generator. Um, this was really just a working hypothesis. It was trial and error at this point. They had no idea what was going on. They knew I couldn't be on prednisone forever, even though that was the only thing that helped. Um, but this was just a guess, trial and error. I did find a surgeon who could do an arthroscopic removal of this bone, and we agreed this is the best way to go, so let's do it. Now, one big reason why they were unsure that this was the exact diagnosis and what was causing the swelling is because of the typical presentation of Ostrigonum syndrome. The way Ostrigonum syndrome typically presents is there's pain and usually just a little swelling. Like you can palpate it, but you can't really see it too much. It's pain with plantar flexion, especially in weight bearing. It's most common in dancers. I don't dance. I couldn't dance to save my life, particularly the types of dances where you're in a, a really high amount of plantar flexion. So yes, I have pain with plantar flexion, especially in weight bearing, but I'm not a dancer. I don't have minimal swelling. I would call it maximal swelling. And the pain is horrible. It's not just during plantar flexion. It's increased by that, but it's resting pain. It's pain that made me unable to sleep. Um, if we look at this here, the posterior Taylor process between the ages of about seven and 13, uh, there's a free floating bone called an os trigonum. We all start out with one, but it's supposed to fuse with the talus. But in a small percentage of people, about 7%, it fails to fuse. Now it can either undergo what's called a partial fusion or no fusion at all. A partial fusion would be where the os trigonum starts to get ingested, so to speak, into the talus, but it doesn't get ingested all the way. So it leaves this residual bump on the posterior aspect of the talus. That is called a styeda process. It turns out on the left side, I have a styeda process. Another asymmetry there, um, where it only partially fused, but it sticks out. And so it can cause posterior impingement, but it's usually not near as severe. So yes, my left side did get one partial flare up, but it has never flared up since or before that. On my right side though, an os trigonum, so no fusion at all. In the vast majority of people with an os trigonum, it's asymptomatic. They go their whole lives, never even know they have one, unless they see it on an x-ray, but it's not ever a cause for concern. So of the unfortunate few of those that are symptomatic, you try conservative treatment first. Well, you know what? The vast majority of those people respond to conservative treatment. And very rarely is there no response, thus requiring surgical incision. So it's very rare that the os trigonum is going to be symptomatic enough to excise. But causing that type of swelling, unheard of. It's normally less than one centimeter. It's a very, very small bone. It can be smooth or it can have serrated margins. This is the os trigonum that they pulled out of my ankle. Definitely not smooth, it is very, very serrated. 
Uh, it looks like the asteroid that took out Harry Stamper from Armageddon. It's gnarly. And right here, the ruler, you can see one centimeter. They're normally less than that. Uh, if they moved this point up here to the zero mark, total in length, it would probably measure about 2.9 centimeters. It's a pretty big Oztrigonum, and it was so big, in fact, that the surgeon told me afterward that since he did it arthroscopically, he was not expecting this. Um, this was not visible on the x-ray or the MRI. So when he's pulling it out, he almost had to make an incision beyond the arthroscopic hole just to get this out. He didn't end up having to do that, but he had to really yank at it, which couldn't have been pleasant, uh, but he got it out. And to this day, I have not had any flare-ups, anything like that of that ankle. No swelling, nothing. Just some residual post-surgical issues that ultimately stem from all the damage that this did to my foot and ankle while it was in there. So some of the post-surgical struggles that I had and I have been working on, and some are pretty much completely better at this point, was right quadricep and glute weakness. Really some glute amnesia on the right side. I was not weight bearing a lot on that side. I was definitely favoring my left and I certainly wasn't doing a lot of closed chain leg exercises uh, in the 10 months while I was suffering from this. So the right quad and glutes were weak. I had to retrain particularly the glute med on the right side to relearn how to fire and get that mind muscle connection. I had horrible restricted joint mobility that required a lot of manual therapy and physical therapy after I this happened. So talocural glide, the intrinsic foot joints were all stiff. Hip internal rotation, I'm still working on that. Tibial internal rotation, still working on that. And then I have a calcaneal external rotation deformity. So not at the hip, not at the tibia, but the, the actual, the foot is externally rotated a little bit too much on that side. Might just be something that I gotta live with. And then I've got ankle mobility restrictions. My plantar flexion, I'm working on it, but it's still pretty limited. Um, I can't imagine there's not a lot of scar tissue in that ankle having something come out of there that size that was causing that many problems. So plantar flexion range is still limited for me. Inversion and eversion are a lot better by the time I'm making this video, but I would say that um, inversion and eversion are both limited by probably about five degrees from normal at this point. Um, I've had total arch collapse on that side. Um, the ligaments within the foot are shot. Um, the arch is totally collapsed. I'm in the process of trying to get some, some uh, custom arch support specifically for that side. Um, the bunion, I don't have it listed here, but is worse on this side. And that's possibly because of all that compensation externally rotating with each step. Um, it's possibly from the arch collapse. Um, but you can see that it's much, much worse on this side compared to the left. Um, and that's something that was only present ever since this all started. Um, I've also got hemosiderin staining on the right foot. You can see here. Let's actually zoom in a little bit. Um, you don't see it on the left, but there's a lot of these bumps here. You can see the hemosiderin staining on the right foot. And in case you forgot, hemosiderin staining is something that occurs for people with chronic venous insufficiency. Um, what ultimately happened, what the doctor thinks, what led to the swelling, and I totally agree with this, is that the swelling, you know, it would go to the sinusoidal pattern to be good, good, but it would reach a critical threshold and then it would just continue to increase. And the swelling was so bad that it got to a point where it was actually cutting off the tibial vein and the lymphatics. And so it was cutting those off and so the rate of swelling and getting fluid in was exceeding the rate to clear it out. And so it's definitely plausible that prednisone or a similar corticosteroid is the only thing that would help. And then I've had issues with uh, resisted plantar flexion, squats, especially the ones in right single leg. Again, working on all of these, but it's amazing to me that one, I'll still say a little bone, because even though it's almost three centimeters, it's still, you know, pretty small bone. Um, the fact that it could do as much damage as it did is astounding. Um, and very rarely does Oztrigonum syndrome ever present like this. In fact, the doctor told me he's never seen it before. But 
We got the right diagnosis. It was right Ostrigonum syndrome. And other than a few little things here that are mostly all good now, I'm doing great. So I think this video illustrates two things. Number one, I don't blame any doctors for thinking this was non-musculoskeletal. I mean, that swelling, that's awful. That does not look musculoskeletal, especially when there's no traumatic incident. I mean, if you sprained your ankle really bad, maybe you have some swelling, but generally speaking, it doesn't even look that bad in the foot. So yeah, it appears like it might be non-musculoskeletal, but sometimes it's still musculoskeletal. So when you're working in the clinic, don't ever assume with 100% certainty, if you see something like that, that it is non-musculoskeletal. It may be. And then also, maybe somebody watching out there is suffering from something that looks almost identical or at least very, very similar. It took the doctors and me a very long time to figure out what was going on. Maybe I can expedite the issue for someone else and help somebody else out there. So hopefully you found this interesting. Please make sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit that notification button for notifications for all videos in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you.